Welcome in. Welcome in. We are back. The NCAA tournament is here. I love NFL. I love MLB. I love college basketball regular season. There is nothing that compares to the NCAA tournament. It's the best sporting event of the year, in my opinion. The first four days of this tournament are the best four days of the year, in my opinion. And I couldn't be more excited that it's back. If you're new here, my name is Ben Hostler. I am the VP of content here at DFS Karma and Bet Karma. And I'm going to tell you how to win your March Madness bracket pool this year. We are going to talk strategy in this video. I'm going to tell you exactly how I attack my pools. I've been very successful. The track record is there. Uh, I can provide receipts. I've done so on Twitter uh, in years past. But I can tell you exactly how I attack my pools uh, using strategy. And then I'm going to pull up the bracket. And I'm not going to fill out the bracket because we're saving the goods for the premium members. If you want to sign up at betcarma.com slash pricing, I'm going to show you the tools on the site here before we dive into the bracket. You will get access to those tools for the college basketball tournament games, whether it be the NCAA tournament or the NIT. Uh, we have those tools available for all sports as well. So you get access to the tools. You get access to the Discord where I share my daily betting cards in there uh, throughout the year. Since the start of 2023, I am up over 180 units betting, uh, and that is all tracked, uh, provided for our members. If you join the Discord, there will be people in there that will vouch um, for how just good of a community is. And, you know, I, I look forward to to uh, entertaining you guys and interacting with you in there as well. So you get the tools. You get my daily betting cards. I also wrote several premium articles which are live on the site right now at betcomer.com which you can access only if you're a premium member that dives into some key stats trends teams that i like teams that i'm fading in the ncaa tournament that's been live on the site since yesterday you get access to that and you get access to my brackets i'm going to post three brackets in the discord for different pool sizes whether it be small size pools medium or your large size pools which i think most people play they're hunting the big prizes um, so I'll have all that in there. So I'm not going to fill out the bracket on this video, but I'm going to dive in. I'm going to pull the bracket up. We're going to give high level thoughts on each region. Um, and we're going to talk strategy. So as you can see on my screen here, I have the bet karma pulled up. This is one of our premium tools, live trends. This has public betting data from DraftKings, uh, which is a useful tool. You can see where the public is. You can see where the big money's coming in. We also have our money line predictor, uh, which is a very this this money line predictor was very very good in baseball last season definitely had some success in NFL college football college basketball with it as well but it provides you where the edges are if you're looking to bet a team on the money line or if you're looking to find an underdog you can see which of these big favorites are overvalued and we also have total predictor spread predictor as well very very useful tools and um I look forward to to you guys checking them out. I think you should hop in, sign up for the month, see if you like them. Um, and then if you do, you know, you can stick around. You're going to win your money back based off of uh, the bets that you put in throughout the month anyways. That, that will pay off your sub. And uh, I would look forward to you guys checking that out and sticking around in there. With that being said, let's pull up the bracket and let's dive in. Uh, I also want to note that we are running a bracket pool for members of our discord you do not have to be a premium member uh to enter this bracket pool if you win first in the bracket pool which i'm linking below in the description so if you want to join our free bracket pool on espn the link will be in the description click that join put your bracket in if you win you get a free year subscription to bet karma 100 free and if you come in the top five uh but you don't get first so two through fifth if you are an active Bet Karma member, you will get your last charge or your last month, whatever your subscription is, that will get refunded back to you. So you basically got a free membership for the month uh, if you place top five. So that link is in the description. Click that, put your bracket in, and uh, we'll see if you guys can beat me. I want to talk strategy before anything, before we even dive into the bracket, because the reason I love this tournament so much, the reason I love playing in bracket pools so much is because of the mass amount of people that are going to be in your pools and the mass amount of people that you're playing against that just aren't going about this contest uh, in this tournament the correct way. So if you know anything about me or this channel, 
Uh, predominantly, a lot of my content nowadays is centered around sports betting because of how big it is, uh, and it's only getting bigger. But we still play daily fantasy sports. I still provide daily fantasy sports content, and that's what I got started doing. I've been providing daily fantasy sports content and playing for close to 10 years at this point. And if you, it's so easy to attribute this March Madness bracket, A, and the contests to a DFS contest. So let's just pretend that you're waking up on a Sunday and you're going to put in a, a DFS NFL DraftKings lineup, right? You're, you're waking up on Sunday and you're going to put your lineup in. And let's say you're going to play in a contest with 200 people. Now, there are ways to put yourself at an advantage in that contest against 200 other people based off how you construct your team and based off how you use the projected ownership levels, which we have in our projections portal and all that stuff. You can encompass all that stuff together and put yourself at an advantage against those 199 other people in that DFS contest. Now, would it not be easier to put yourself at an advantage if you knew who those other 199 people were playing in their lineups? It would be much easier. The March Madness bracket pools are the only game in the year 2024 where we have access to that information. We have the answers to the math problem. We have the pieces to the puzzle. We know who our opponents are taking. We know what our opponents are doing. And we can use that information to put ourselves in a better position to win these pools. And not enough people are thinking of it like this. Not enough people are using this free and public information to their advantage. Uh, and what I'm referencing is you can access very easily the public pick percentage of bracket groups, whether it be on CBS, Yahoo Sports, ESPN. ESPN took their um, page down, it looks like, that they've had up the last few years. Uh, but you can still get that information on who people... Uh, this is just data from everyone on the website that's filled out a bracket. You can get this public pick percentage uh, data and you can see who people are picking, how often people are picking them. And it's very, very easy to cross reference this information with Vegas odds, what Vegas thinks the actual true outcome is going to be and um, several other factors, honestly. So uh, I would say that if you're going to to be playing in these contests, I would be studying this public information on who is picking who and using that to your advantage. Um, second major part of strategy for March Madness bracket pools would be knowing your pool size, which I think is another factor that people just don't think through. And, and this can be used in DFS as well. People do not really think thing like uh they, they don't bake it in enough i feel like people try to get too crazy when they don't need to or they play too conservative you know when they need to be more crazy so knowing your pool size is also very very important if you're only playing against 50 other people you don't need to take 18 upsets in the first round you don't need to take two double digit seeds to the elite eight. If you're playing against 49 other people, um, if you're playing against 500 other people, should you be a little bit more contrarian than if you were, if you were playing against 50 people? Sure. Uh, if you're playing against 10,000 other people, that is when I feel like you really need to hunt out, uh, the high leverage spots, uh, both early stages of the tournament and late. But if you're playing in an office pool or a work pool with just 70 other people that you work with and, you know, maybe half of them aren't even very uh, knowledgeable when it comes to and not even college basketball, because I, I think that it would be very not easy, but um, you could have success in this sort of uh, contest with the bracket pool without having watched any college basketball if you were able to maximize the pick percentages of the public and on top of that the key factors that lead you to teams that actually have a path to win the tournament because 
of all the 68 teams in this tournament, there's really only a list of five to 10 that have any realistic chance of winning the tournament or have any chance of making a deep run. There's several teams ranked, uh, not ranked, but seeded high that have a very, very slim chance historically to make any sort of run to the Elite Eight or Final Four. So using those factors of we know the group of teams that are potential champions, we know the group of teams that we should not be targeting early in our bracket pools, we know the list of teams that uh, are potential spoilers that could win maybe one or two games. Um, Using that coupled with the public ownership information that we have of who is picking who, that is the Konami code. And that's what you really need to be maximizing when you're making your bracket pools. But adjusting that for your pool size is critical. If you're playing against 50 people, you don't have to get too crazy. If you're playing in a 10,000 group, you do need to maximize leverage. You have no chance of winning if you're not using um, that information available to you if you're playing in a large field pool. And finally, I will just say that uh, especially if you're playing in a 200 or less person field, uh, you're you're really like, until your team that you pick to win it all loses, you are going to be firmly in the mix. That can be said for any pool size, but specifically for those lower pools. Um, for example, I'm not going to you know dive in fully here until we get into the regions, but for example, UConn, they're the best team in the country. They're ranked number one, they're the number one overall seed. They are the most public champion pick this season. They're getting picked over 30% of the time in public brackets. So if you're taking you if you're not taking Yukon, but you have Yukon in the final four, for for example, and they lose in the sweet 16, that doesn't matter. Like I feel like the average person would be upset about that, but especially if you're playing in a smaller sized pool, your the, the, the smaller your pool is, the higher those pick percentages are are going to rise. So in the mass amounts of millions of brackets that have been filled out on ESPN or Yahoo Sports, UConn's getting picked in 30 to 31% of them. If you take that and you isolate that to your exact pool and it's a 200-person pool, I guarantee you UConn's getting picked higher than 30% in that 200-person pool. So the fact that you didn't have them winning at all, even if you had them in the Final Four and they lose in the Sweet 16, you're killing off 40 to 50% off the top of my head bracket. So it doesn't matter. So if, as long as the team you pick to win is alive, you have a chance to win your pool, especially if you're in a smaller sized bracket pool. Um, so that's my high level thoughts in terms of strategy. Make sure you're referencing the public pick percentages, make sure you're referencing your pool size. Um, and to, to go along with the pool size, uh, strategy talk, make sure you know the exact rules of your bracket pool because there are pools out there that reward bonus points for upsets or higher point totals per round for upsets. Like Those are the type of things where you would look to get more crazy, whereas if you're in a traditional scoring pool, you, know, you don't need to be quite as crazy. So know your pool size, know the scoring, know the public pick percentages, know what your opponents are doing, and use all of that information to your advantage when you're filling out these brackets all right let's dive into the actual bracket now let's take a look like i said i'm not going to fill out the exact bracket because i'm saving the goods for the premium members betkarma.com slash pricing uh if you want to access um and it's not even like i'm not saying you should sign up to get my brackets i'm just providing a tool for members of how I would how I would build a bracket for a certain pool size. Like I said, I'm going to post one for a small, medium, large size pool. Uh, so let's go. Let's start in the east here. It's been said by everyone that uh, dissects brackets. UConn got absolutely screwed. They're the number one overall seed, but they were placed. If you guys watch the UEFA Champions League, every year there's a group of death, they call it. This is the bracket of death over here. You have UConn, you have um, several teams that won their conference championship 
such as UAB, Auburn, Duquesne. Uh, even though I, Duquesne is overseeded as an 11, they still did win the A-10. Uh, Illinois won the Big Ten. Moorhead State won their conference. Uh, Drake won the MVC. And Iowa State won the Big 12. South Dakota State won theirs as well. So tons of conference champions are in this bracket. On top of that, um, UConn, Auburn, uh, Illinois to an extent, uh, Iowa State. Like These are some of the best teams in the country. And I think that far and away, top to bottom, this is the most stacked region. So one key factor that I'll tell you from the start, which I'm not going to give out all the stats and trends that I typed up in these articles. A lot of them are very public. People know about these stats by now. But the big factor when it comes to defending champions, no, the NCAA tournament has not had a back-to-back -back champion since the 2006-2007 Joe Kim Noah-led Florida Gators. On top of that, I'm pretty sure that no team has made, no number one seed has made it past the Sweet 16 since those Florida Gators. So I feel like personally, the committee was kind of stacking the odds against UConn to go along with that fact that there has not been a repeat champion in quite some time because they put them in the most loaded possible bracket. Um, even their second round matchup, FAU and Northwestern are both very good teams. They've both beaten good teams. FAU has a win over Arizona this year. Northwestern has a win over Purdue. So they're, those are like, those are capable teams in the second round. So I think top to bottom, this is the best region. I think UConn top to bottom is the best team in college basketball. That's pretty clear to me, but the best team doesn't always win. Um, I think that we're looking at a potential Sweet 16 matchup between Auburn and UConn, and that would be a great game. Auburn has all the factors that you look for in a potential NCAA champion. They There's one criteria that they don't fit the mold of, but in terms of their offense, defense, all that stuff, they fit the mold as an NCAA champion, and they match up well with UConn. They have great guard play. They have Janai Broom that they can match up with Donovan Klingon. And I honestly don't know who I would pick in that game. I think the spread would be pretty close between a UConn and Auburn. And I think that would be a really fun game. So I think we have a collision course in the Sweet 16, potentially of Auburn versus UConn. In the bottom half of the bracket, uh, Illinois is a team that I'm going to be looking to fade. If you know anything about me and these brackets the last few years, the one thing I love to do, I will fade these teams that are really good on offense but really bad on defense. I will fade them time and time again. Illinois fits that mold. I don't care that they just won the Big Ten tournament. I don't care that they have Terrence Shannon Jr., who's one of the most dynamic players in college basketball. I don't care. Their defensive profile has, A, never won a national championship, and B, if you look at all the teams that profile similarly to this Illinois team in the past, let's say like 20 to 30 tournaments, it is very, very rare that they can even get to the Elite Eight or Final Four. Last year, we did have one team that fits this mold that made a miraculous run to the to the Final Four that broke models that we hadn't seen before. That was the Miami Hurricanes. Uh, but it's important to remember that the Miami Hurricanes were losing by eight points with around six minutes left in their first round game against the Drake Bulldogs. And they just escaped with the win. The path opened up and they made a run to the final four. So it's not impossible, but I'm not going to bet on a mathematical anomaly. I'm going to fade this Illinois team. You don't have to pick them out in round one, but I will not be taking this Illinois team to go very far in my tournament. Uh, Iowa State is fitting of a mold. I think Ryan Hammer uh, on Twitter had this stat, but no two seed. I, I don't remember if he said no two seed. I think no two seed had ever made the final four. Definitely not won the title, but had. I don't even think they made the final four having been unranked coming into the season. Iowa State fits that mold. Iowa State can disappear times offensively. So, you know, this could be a, a spot where we look to to fade them. Um, I, the team that really sticks out to me, I think Moorhead State is a really fun Cinderella team, potential with Riley Minnix and, and how well they shoot the three, but 
The team that really sticks out to me here is the is Drake. I liked them last year. I picked them over Miami last year. They were very, very close to, to upsetting them. And the reason they didn't was their best player, Tucker DeVries, scored three points in that game against Miami last year. He shot one of 13 from the floor. If you don't know anything about Tucker DeVries, Tucker DeVries is the best mid-major player in the entire country. He actually averages the highest points per game against quad one opponents in the entire country. Tucker DeVries, higher than Zach Eady, higher than Terrence Shannon, uh, higher than Mark Sears from Alabama. Tucker DeVries is a dog, and he is not going to shoot one for 13 from the floor in their tournament game again. On top of that, um, I think that Drake top to bottom as a team is much better than they were last year anyways. So Moorhead State, I think, is fun. Drake is a potential like bracket buster uh, in this region, I think. And uh, BYU is interesting too. I just don't know. I don't know how a potential like I don't know if BYU could beat Auburn or UConn should they match up uh, in the Elite Eight. But uh, I don't know. I don't know. Drake sticks out to me as a, as the potential bracket buster in this region, but I'm not sure how far I will take them. Let's go down to the West. The West is an absolute mess. Any of these teams could get to the Final Four. We have UNC, who's the weakest one seed. I referenced this on our live stream yesterday, but Vegas is telling you that North Carolina is the weakest one seed. They're not even favored to get out of their region. Arizona is. So you have the weakest one seed. Arizona has historically struggled in the NCAA tournament under Tommy Lloyd. He's never won a game against the spread with uh, this Arizona team in the tournament in two tournament runs. They lost to Princeton early last year. They just haven't been great in the tournament. So, you know, I think they're top to bottom, a really, really good team, but they have had tournament struggles. So I think we could see some chaos here. I think St. Mary's is capable uh, of making a run here. I think Michigan State is capable of making a run here. People are very, very down on this Michigan State team which I find really interesting because typically by the time we get to this point of the year, Michigan state there, a lot of times have been this mid seed, a seven, eight, six, seven, eight, nine seed. I feel like, and people want to take them because of the January, February is a, but for whatever reason this year, people are very, very down on this Michigan state team, but I would caution, I would caution you to, to not write off Sparty so quick. They're actually the eighth overall unluckiest team in the country per Ken Palm. They have had severe bad luck this year. They have had severe late game, close game bad luck. They could easily have three to four more wins. And I think, you know, we would be talking completely different about this team. They've played Purdue twice in the last month and lost by like five and six points. They've played them really, really close. Uh, they... You know, it was perceived as a bad loss early season against James Madison, but James Madison is the best mid-major team in the country, and, and they're, you know, a 12 seed in the tournament. So really, how bad was that loss? Like, the first night of the season, yeah, it looked bad that Michigan State got upset by three points on their home floor against James Madison, but James Madison's a 12 team in the tournament. They won, like, 30 games, and they're, you know, the best mid-major team in the country. So really, it wasn't that bad of a loss, I don't think. Uh, they lost by single digits to Duke earlier this season. Uh, in November, they lost by single digits to Arizona. In November as well, Michigan State, uh, they they beat Baylor. The three seed in this region, Baylor, Michigan State, beat them by 20 points uh, comfortably. So, you know, they, they've proven they can beat a good team that's in their own region. They have some other, you know, good wins as well. Uh, they beat Illinois earlier this season. Uh, they beat Northwestern, who is a, a decent tournament team as well. So I, I would caution you not to write off Sparty so quickly just because of how unlucky they've been. They could easily win a couple games in the tournament, and I wouldn't be shocked. St. Mary's is a good team. I feel like they're being undervalued. Grand Canyon seems like a pretty chalky upset pick. I'm not really seeing that. Alabama fits the mold of those really good offensive teams and really bad defensive teams that I'm going to be looking to fade. So, you know, you can take Alabama completely out of consideration for me. Uh, I don't like this Baylor team. You can take them out of consideration for me as well. The only double-digit seed here, I think, that can make it runs New Mexico. 
Uh, we haven't, we took a national title future on New Mexico back in like January. So I've been really high on this team all season. They have great guard play uh, with Toppin. They do have some size. If he can avoid getting in foul trouble, they're well coached by Rich Patino. So uh, if they get past Clemson, I would definitely be interested in taking New Mexico to make the Sweet 16, and then we'll see what happens. So New Mexico is probably a pretty chalky pick for an underdog, but uh, I like them to maybe make a run, and uh, I would be cautious to completely write off Michigan State. But Michigan State could could easily win, uh, could easily lose their first game as well. Let's move over to the Midwest here. Everyone's favorite team, Purdue. Perennial chokers. They lost to a double-digit seed the last three years. North Texas, St. Peter's, and Fairleigh Dickinson as a one seed last year. Purdue is your one seed. Uh, you also have Gonzaga McNeese, which is one of the funnest uh, opening round games uh, in the 5-12 spot. Uh, you have an under, I would say, like undervalued Kansas team, but also just the worst Kansas team we've seen in some time as the four seed. Uh, you have Creighton as a three, who I think is a really, really good team. And then you have Tennessee at two with Dalton Connect uh, and all that. So I don't know. Th this, this, there could be, se I think this region, this region is not as weak as the West. The West, in my opinion, is a weak region. And that's why you could see any team come out of there in the final four. The Midwest is not a weak region, but there's enough good teams that that could be why you get a random team in the final four. Not because of the weakness of the region, but just there's good teams. Purdue, Gonzaga, uh, Oregon, Creighton, even McNeese if you want to get crazy. Tennessee. Um, so I think you could see a, a number of teams make the final four here. I like the path for Creighton a little bit. They have an, uh, a scary first round game against Akron. Creighton is very, very live or die by the three-point shot. And they run a lot of stuff with, uh, you know, Kalkbrenner uh, at the five. Akron does have a big man, Freeman, that can match up with Kalkbrenner. And Akron is very good at defending the three. So it's a little bit of a scary first round matchup. But the, if they can get past the zips, I do think they beat whoever comes out of South Carolina, Oregon. And I like, I really like how Creighton matches up potentially with Tennessee, should that be the matchup. I think Kalkbrenner would be able to bully them down low. Tennessee does not have a ton of size, and they don't have a ton of depth in terms of big men. Kalkbrenner notoriously does not foul. He does not get in foul trouble. He's never fouled out in a game at Creighton. So I think that there's mismatches that Creighton can exploit in a matchup against Tennessee, and I would, I would lean Creighton in that game, and I'm sure the spread would be very close as well. So I kind of like the path for the Creighton Blue Jays here at the bottom. Uh, the top is just a mess. I mean, Purdue has been dominant this year, more so than in years past, given how they've been able to score. They're the second best three-point shooting team per Ken Palm. Uh, they're the third overall offense uh, in adjusted offensive efficiency per Ken Palm. They're very, very good offensive offensively, and I think that helps them. Their three-point shooting helps them when Zach Eady doesn't get it going, if Zach Eady's not getting calls. All that stuff. So Purdue's better this year than in years past, in my opinion. I like Gonzaga more than I should, I think. They did not look good in the WCC title game against St. Mary's. But the metrics love this team. They're typically a pretty popular pick when it comes to the brackets. But for this, this year, they're not. They're having a down year. And in years past, it's been very clear to fade Gonzaga because of the popularity of them. They are not a popular pick this year. So I think Gonzaga is intriguing to me. If they can get past McNeese. Um, McNeese is a really fun team with Shahada Wells, Shoemate, and those guys. I just don't know about the step up in, the, in, in competition coming up to the NCAA tournament. I mean, they really beat up on their on their conference i mean i i'm pretty sure they, they haven't lost a game since before thanksgiving um they really really dominated their conference and they're a really good team and i do think like i i don't know if mcneese could win multiple games to get to face purdue but i do think mcneese is a bad matchup for purdue because they would play similarly to fairly dickinson last year mcneese is not a big team and fairly dickinson was not a big team they just played really really aggressive on defense and I think that McNeese could do something similar to Purdue in a potential matchup. I just don't know if McNeese could win multiple games to get there. 
I like the winner of Gonzaga McNeese over Kansas. Even if Dickinson and McCullough are healthy, I just haven't loved this Kansas team this year. And um, yeah, I don't know. I'm I'm down on Kansas. Everyone is, so they're not as po- another example where typically Gonzaga and Kansas are popular picks. That's not the case this year. So I guess you could you could build a case for Kansas because they're being undervalued relative to what they usually are, but they just don't have as good of a team. They don't have any depth. If Hunter Dickinson gets in foul trouble, they have no depth behind him. And I, I just think it's it's going to be tough for them to win, you know, two and three, four tournament games. So that's my take there. And then we'll finish up in the South. Uh, Houston is your number one seed here. And this is an interesting kind of bracket because there's a lot of teams that I would like to fade here. Uh, Kentucky is similar to Illinois and Alabama in terms of the teams that are really, really good on offense and really bad on defense. I don't trust them to be able to defend well enough for two, three, four games in a row to make a run. So uh, I'm going to be lower on Kentucky. I'm going to be lower uh, probably on Duke. Duke's metrics look good, and they look like a team that can make a run. But I have severe questions about Duke's physicality and their ability to play against a team that's going to play physical. Like, if we do get a Duke versus Houston matchup in the Sweet 16, I just really don't see how Duke could beat them. Um, the the only way the only way that you can beat Houston is getting lucky and making a bunch of outside shots because they're so good defensively. They're so good at hitting the glass. Duke could do that because they have a bunch of good three point shooters. If they just happen to have their shot falling that day, maybe they could pull something crazy. But Duke is very soft on the interior. We've seen it in two games against North Carolina, and even when Duke beat. So Duke has played NC State twice recently. Uh, they beat them once. DJ Burns had like 27 points, and then they lost to DJ Burns and NC State in the ACC tournament. Duke's very soft on the interior, and I think they would really, really struggle uh, in a matchup against Houston. I think Houston would dominate them on the glass. I think they would get a ton of rebounds. So I struggle to see how Duke could beat Houston in a potential Sweet 16 matchup. So I'm lower on Kentucky. I'm lower on Duke. I'm lower on Houston, but it's like at some point we have to take someone here. And then at the bottom of the the bracket, we have Marquette. I like the metrics for Marquette. I like what Marquette's done without Tyler Kolick. I don't like that I don't know the health of Tyler Kolick, and I'm not going to know until well after brackets lock truly how healthy he is. The one thing that gives me pause with Marquette, Shaka Smart, since 2011, when he took VCU to the Final Four, He has never made it past the second round of the NCAA tournament. That gives me pause. Now, I want to say, when I I rank out key metrics, key stats, all that stuff, the coaching stuff is usually lower on my board because we we have seen coaches buck trends. The narrative coming into last season with UConn was that Danny Hurley couldn't win in the NCAA tournament. And what happened? They went and won the, the national championship. So... I weigh the coaching stuff, but it's it's lower on my list than other factors. But I, I I can't not bring up that he's been in the tournament almost every year since 2011 and has not made it out of the second round. And it's not like he's had bad teams. Now, last year, he did have a banged up Kolick as well, but he's got a banged up Kolick this year. So I don't know what to make with that. I, I don't know what to make of that. And uh, I think this is a really, really interesting region. I think that Houston like really sets up well just because I I really like how they match up with Duke in a potential Sweet 16 game. I think that Nebraska or Texas A&M can give Houston a tougher game than Duke in the Sweet 16. And let me tell you why. Texas A&M plays horrible on offense. They are one of the worst shooting teams in the country. But they get every offensive rebound. They're a top three offensive rebounding team in the in the country. So that's what Houston wants to play defense and hit the glass. Texas A&M wants to hit the glass. So it's a bad matchup because it's a strength for both teams and they both want to do it. So you have some variance potential there. Houston and Texas A&M did play earlier this season. Texas A&M only lost by four points. And Texas A&M has Wade Taylor, who absolutely shows up and balls out against top opponents. Wade Taylor went on in a crazy run in the SEC tournament. Evan Mia 
has Jamal Shedd of Houston ranked as the best overall on-ball defender in the country. Does anybody want to guess what Wade Taylor did against Jamal Shedd and Houston in that game earlier this season? Wade Taylor gave him 34 points. No one in the country gives Jamal Shedd and Houston 34 points. So I think Texas A&M is a scary matchup for Houston, and I think Nebraska is too. This Nebraska team is undervalued because they play in the Big Ten and they've never, I'm pretty sure they've never, I don't know if they've ever won an NCAA tournament game or they haven't in like 30 years. I don't know what the exact stat is. Someone in the in the comments can, can correct me on that, but uh, they're undervalued because they're Nebraska and they play in the Big Ten. But this team is legitimate. They are very, very good defensively. If you look at Bart Torvik and if you isolate it for second half of the season, for example, if you go to uh, February 1st to now, Nebraska is the third overall defensive team per Torvik. If you even extend it two weeks, go February 14th or 15th to now, they're the fourth overall defensive team on Torvik. This team can defend. They shut down Zach Eady in both matchups, which no one in the country has done. They shut down Zach Eady in both matchups this year. They're very good defensively. They can get hot from three, which I just said you have to get hot from three to beat Houston. My one concern is a lot of their hot from three comes from Tominaga, and I don't know if Tominaga can play against Houston. We have seen at times this year, Hoiberg has had to bench Tominaga because of uh, just his physicality, and he just wasn't able to stay on the floor in some of those grinded out games. Houston is one of those grinded out games. I don't know how successful he can be in a matchup against Houston. So those are my concerns there, but I think both of those teams uh, could present Houston uh, potentially a tougher game than Duke. Uh, so this is a really interesting region as well. But that being said, we have talked strategy. We have talked the bracket. Do we want a championship pick? I wasn't going to give it out, but I will give it out. For, as of right now, as of this very second, my 2024 NCAA championship pick is the Arizona Wildcats. The Arizona Wildcats fit every metric you could want. I think they have a clean path because they're in a region with the weakest one seat. The one concern is no Western Coast team, no West Coast team has won the NCAA tournament since Arizona in 1997. Can they buck that trend? They have not played well coming into the tournament. So I don't know if I'm going to stick with this pick, but that's my pick right now. If you wait, if you watch this video and you made it this far, I really, really appreciate it. Thank you so much. Like the video on YouTube, share it with your friends. Um, subscribe to the channel so you know when we post future uh, content. And uh, I do a live stream Monday through Friday here on the channel as well at 3 p.m. Eastern. So you guys can come tune in for that. Be sure you join the free bracket pool that's linked in the description. Check out the website, betkarma.com, um, and then betkarma.com slash pricing if you want to sign up for the premium access. Good luck in your bracket pools this year, and hopefully we make some money.